I hope that you feel like you're a part of the family. That's really what, uh, that, 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 that's really what, what uh, we are, and that is, you know, there are many ways to talk about the church, but there's a, there's a song in our book, number 855, that says, we're part of a family. We're going to use that as the basis of our lesson today, and normally I'd say, take out your Bibles and open it up, and we'll want you to have your Bibles open But uh, make sure you have your songbook open too. You'll want to meditate somewhat about the words that are of this song. But we don't come immediately to that song. Let's talk about this amazing thing called church. Isn't it remarkable how many things and how many ways there are to refer to the church? I want you to think about that for a minute. Think of all the descriptions that are used. The parables of Jesus, like the church being like a vineyard. That's, that's an amazing description of the church. Jesus talks about, in, in, uh, not in that, in that parable about the vineyard, but He talks about the church being like the vine and branches. And while He doesn't use the word church in relationship to that, that's one of those descriptions there is of the church. Well, what about thinking about the church as the, as the kingdom of heaven? I want you to think about what church is. There's the, there's the kingdoms of this world. And there have been some amazing kingdoms of this world. You think of the power of ancient kingdoms like the kingdom of Alexander the Great, and the Grecian power that was there. You think about the power of Nebuchadnezzar and the Persian Empire that came after him. And, and then that Grecian, and what about the Roman Empire? And then what about why we do not have a king? What about the unbelievable impact that our own nation has had without being a kingdom We've been of citizens of that kingdom and and we've reached out and impacted the world. But let me tell you something. I want you to hear this concept that we are the kingdom of God, we're the kingdom of heaven. That's an expression used over and over in the Bible. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And the kingdom of heaven is like was a very common expression that Jesus used. But think about those words. We're part not of some earthly kingdom, but our citizenship is in heaven. I want you to just contemplate that, that for a moment. There are individuals who, who wish they'd been born in some other land, and so they, they travel to other lands, sometimes illegally, just to be a part of the things that are found in that. But you understand that we're part of the kingdom of heaven. And there will someday be that time, and David will be talking about this, when we all get to heaven, when Jesus comes back, and, 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 and we're all there in heaven. Is that exciting to you? You're an American? Yeah, you may be, but above that, I'm a Christian, and my citizenship is in heaven. And how amazingly wonderful it is for us to think about the fact that before the world began, God had in mind a plan that involved someday establishing and putting something on this earth called the church, and you and I are a part of that. Do you understand that we are a part of the kingdom of heaven? Before the world began, God knew there'd be the church in the 21st century. And we are a part of that which God planned from all eternity. And oh, what a blessing it is to think about that. How about us being the bride of Christ? You've been to a wedding lately. You stop and think about how beautiful that bride looks. I don't know that I've ever seen an ugly bride. I've seen some that were a little bit above mediocre, but I have never, I've, I've never seen an ugly bride. Well, doesn't she look nice and everything? Do you understand? That's the way we look to the Lord Jesus. That groom stands and there is that time that he's been waiting for and, and, and he, the doors are open at the back and walking down that door, down that aisle is his bride. You know who Jesus' bride is? Can you imagine how the heart of that groom is involved in thinking about all that bride means to him and how precious she is? That's what we are to God. We're we're the bride of Jesus. And what about us being 
the temple of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17, don't you dare destroy the temple of God because you, the church, ye are the temple of God. Imagine Solomon's temple. And then imagine of that place where Solomon, the richest man on the earth in his day, had taken all of the gold and all of the treasures and brought great huge timbers from up uh, uh, in Lebanon and send them down in the Mediterranean Sea to, and then carry them across all of that terrain to get them up to Jerusalem. And then those stones that were cut out, those massive stones, I don't know for sure how, stone, how large the stones were, in uh, Solomon's temple, but some of those stones in Herod's temple that he built were weighed 20 tons, some of them nearly 40 tons. Imagine how ornately beautiful that temple was whenever Solomon built that. That's God's temple. And in that temple is the holy place, and there is the most holy place. And in that temple is the covenant that God made. You, could it ever get any better than that? Oh, yes. Ye, Palm Beach Lakes, you're the temple of God. And if God dwelt in that most holy place, you are the temple of God through the Spirit of God. God's worked on you. He's worked in your life. And He's tried to change you and help you to be a much of a better person. And He's called you out of the world. And you're God's temple. You see, the temple of God in the 21st century is so amazingly wonderful that the temple of Solomon overlaid with all the treasures of gold of, the, of, the, of Solomon's temple is not worthy to be compared to us as the temple. I think it's remarkable. The simplest term found in the Bible to describe the church is the word church. It's, uh, I get amazed sometimes at some of the names we try to give to refer to something and the names try to make it sound so very, very special. But you see, when God talks about the church, He's just talking about the church. But do you understand what that means? That according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ before the world began... The Lord intended that the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church God's manifold wisdom. And angels of heaven look down and they've seen the grandeur of all that God has done. They've seen the amazing thing that God has done in, 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 in dealing with people on this earth. But when the angels of heaven look down now, he sees people that God called the church. That's what the word church means. Those who were called out. And that's us. And how blessed we are to be that church that was called out by God or called out by Christ. And we become the church of the firstborn. Christ is the firstborn, but in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23, the church of the firstborn, the word firstborn is in the plural, and it talks about us. We're the firstborn of God. And all of those who are babies in families know how special those older brothers and sisters and how much better treated the older brothers and sister, older sisters are than the younger sisters in, in, the, in, in the home. You understand what I'm talking about? God looks at the earth, and of all the people on the earth, that's my firstborn. That's remarkable, isn't it? Firstborn of God. But is there anything better than family? You see, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 goes back to that to look at verse 14. We're led by the Spirit of God. We've sat in uh, homes, we've sat in Bible studies, and Many of us are here this day because somebody opened up the Word of God, words given by the very Spirit of God, and the words are spirit, and the words are life, and they're almighty and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it changed, changed us on the inside. And God led us, and He led us to this place. 
so that we might be His people because we do not serve with the spirit of bondage. Oh no, we're children of God. And we cry out, Abba, Father, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. And the Holy Spirit of God bears witness. God in these remarkable pages says, I'll tell you what a Christian is. I'll tell you what one must do in order that he might be, become a child of God. We read all of these things, and when the Holy Spirit says, this is what you need to do in order to be saved, and when my Spirit says, and that's what I've done, by the mouth of two witnesses, it is established that I am a child of God. The Holy Spirit says, this is what a child of God is, And my spirit says, and this is what I am. And at the mouth of those two witnesses, let every word be established. The kingdom of heaven, the family of God, the temple of the Lord, we're sons. And because we are sons, we're heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. He had a son, and now he has sons, and that's us. And there's nothing on this earth worthy to be compared to that. If we suffer with him, we shall also be glorious with him in some day. I'm not sure the first time that I heard the song, The Family of God. The song was written in 1974. It's not one of the older songs in our books, in those back songs that are where most of them are the newer songs. But oh, how this song captivates what God expects for the church to be. And because we're here at Palm Beach Lakes, I'm going to make application about the, the congregation at this place. Many are from other congregations, and the word could equally be applied to congregations where you come from, but this is homecoming. And for some reason, people have traveled such great distances to be a part of this day and to be a part of this assembly because they're coming home. And we are honored, older brothers and sisters, those from uh, older in the sense that you used to be a part of this congregation in the past. We are so honored that you consider this as home and that you've come home. Why? The words of the song says, we're part of a family that's been born again. You stop and think about the background of so many that are in this this audience. There are some in this audience who can put this in quotation, have a nice background and put in quotation, there are some in this congregation who have an unnice background background, but we're all the same in that respect. Every one of us was lost. The bondage of sin and the values of the world had become our values, and we had embraced all of those values, and whether we were nice or unnice, there is no difference. God has concluded all under sin. And then all of a sudden, God began to work in our lives. And Jesus described what that working in our lives by saying, except you're born again, you'll not enter the kingdom. Nicodemus could not figure out John chapter 3, verse 4. He said, I don't know what this means. How can I be born again? Can you not get back inside the womb? And Jesus says, let me tell you about a new birth. It's a birth, it is a birth that involves the Spirit of God. And it involves water. Sometimes people want to talk about, well, there are two births, one of water and another of the Spirit. That's not what Jesus said. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. One birth, two elements. And so the Word of God came into our lives and we read those stories about Jesus and people reminded us about the God that that loves us and the God who, who, who takes care of us. And the God who sent His Son to die for us. And our hearts were moved. 
and we wanted to be saved. And so we arose and were baptized and buried with Him in baptism. That's where His blood was shed. We're buried into His death. We're raised to walk, to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Verse 5 and 6 says, That old man was crucified. That old man is on the other side of the baptistry, and coming out of that water is a new creature, born of water and born of the Spirit of God. And listen, born into his family. I'm a child of God because I've been born again. And we ought to understand and appreciate that we're a part of that family that's been been born again. The next phrase is, we're part of a family whose love knows no end. How many times in this building or in 36th Street, how many times have you heard the word agape? We use the word agape perhaps even more than we use the word love. Because you see, that's a special kind of love. Agape love is not just an emotional love that where one responds because of a warm feeling that they might have and a temporary excitement that they might have about some situation. But it is that kind of love that allows us to look at enemies. But oh, how wonderful it is when we look at our brethren And we say to them, there is nothing that you can do that will ever stop me loving you. There's nothing you can do. Because agape love says, you can count on me. I'm going to treat you right. I'm going to do uh, whatever is best for you. And it's never, ever, ever going to end. You stop and think. In years past, when the church has had to deal with those who are walking disorderly and how they would be embraced like those have been embraced before who wandered away and who came back home and how whenever they came back to this congregation, they were embraced and welcomed back. Why? Because our love has no end. We loved them when they were here. We loved them when they were doing wrong. We loved them when they left. And we love them when they come back. Why? Because love suffers long. And love is kind. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 8 says, And that love, agape love, never ends. That's not true of every family. You think about earthly families and how people get all sold up at some brother or some sister or something and be all sorts of time. Sometimes people say, I'm glad he's not even in the family. I'm glad he's not a part of the family anymore. Oh no, agape love never ends. And visitors, if this is your first time here in this building, when this, this service ends, I want you to see what happens every time this these services in, and that is folks don't want to get a home. You stand around 30 minutes after we've had a closing prayer, sometimes 45 minutes after services have ended and there are groups still standing around this building loving each other. Why? Because our love has no end. And that's why those of you who've come great distances to be a part of this, we understand that. You love us. And we love you because of what you've done, because our love has no end. Then it says, For Jesus has saved us. You see, salvation is our greatest need. And if the Lord has saved everybody on this earth except us, think of how tragic that would be. But how great it is to think God has saved us. I love the prayer that's a phrase that's in prayers every now and then. When we come to the end of praise and God bless us and help us to go to heaven. 
without the loss of a single one. That's how important salvation is. And if you're not saved this day, this needs to be the day that you've saved. He saved us, and He's made us His own. We belong to our Christ. Sometimes a little child says, with his little short arms, and and by the way, I don't know if you know that little children's arms are so short they can't even not even touch the top of their heads. A little child who's about two years of age says, I love you this much. That's as far as his arms will go out. Just time out so you'll understand something. In New Guinea, where they don't know where when a child has his birthday, he cannot go to school until he can reach his head across and touch his ears. His arm has grown long enough by the time he's age five to get it across his head and touch his ear. And so that little child who's got arms a little bit longer says, I love you this much. And a child says, Mommy and Daddy, I love you this much. Or Granny and Granddad, I love you this much. And I want you to see arms that were stretched out that says, I love you this much. And I want to make you my own. He's made us his own. And we're part of a family that's on its way home. Make sure you stay for that one o'clock lesson when we all get to heaven. We're part of a family that's going home. The second verse says, When a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. That's the way Jesus was, isn't it? Mary and Martha, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. The other sister runs out when she hears the Lord is there and said, Lord, if you'd just been here. And a part of being a part of the family of God is that whenever there is grief and adversity that comes in our lives, that we share it with each other. I marvel sometimes at how many individuals attend funerals in this building. Somebody who has no friends in the world seemingly, but there's a funeral and the church shows up. Maybe sometimes even just a relative of a member of this church, and that member of this church is grieving, and the body of Jesus is there. Some of you have lost mates, husbands, wives. Family felt your grief. Some of you have lost children. And you know the embrace there is from this church You have grief. Well, there's other kinds of grief, and those are those that do not last as long. But there is that that we share relief. Of course, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we sigh. That's the way we are. And one of the things that characterizes this church is we're interested in each other. One of the reasons we put in the bulletins about those who are out of town is so that when you come back in town, somebody says, tell me about your trip. Tell me where you went. What'd you do? What's that all about? That's family. We love each other. And so the Bible says that we rejoice with those that rejoice. We weep with those that weep. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 describes the body as being just like that, where one member is honored, all are honored, and where one is hurting, all are hurting. And then the verse says, together in sunshine, together in rain. I don't know what the future holds for a single one of us in, in this audience this morning. There were folks that were at that last homecoming 
who are not here. There were younger people who were a part of that last homecoming. They're no longer here. That's the uncertainty of the future. And we do not know what the future holds for a single one of us. But how marvelous it is to be part of a family where there are brothers and sisters who are there for us. And when the rain is there, they're there sharing their umbrella or giving us theirs. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when there are good times, we share those good times and how amazing it is. I think of an event that happened just, oh, probably three or four years ago. One of our young people was involved in a, in a I don't know, fourth or fifth, sixth grade basketball game. And would you believe some old folks in this church went over there and they had banners that they held up to try to cheer that little fourth or fifth or sixth grader along. Why? We're with you guys. I want you to hear that. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but there's one member of this church that somebody said, I made all A's on my report card. And that member of the church opened their billfold and gave him $5. You give me $2 and I'll tell you who it was, okay? <laughs> what are we doing? We're family, and you guys are a part of this family. And we love you and appreciate what you've done and what you are doing. You're not the church of the future. You are the, so, such a vital part of what this church is. And we are so thankful for every one of you and for what you are. And those of us who are old and who don't get around as well as we used to. In fact, I think some Sunday morning we ought to have a, a wheelchair a walker stroller race out here just to see which of our, it, it would be fun to have a senior Olympics out here. I don't know if that'd work or not, and I don't know if that'd be sunshine or rain, but I'm sure it'd be sunshine and pain at the end of it. But you stop and think about how great we're together. Sunshine, rain. Because you see, we're together in victory in His holy name. That's us. And how thankful we ought to be to learn to treasure those things which we do have. Look at the chorus. The chorus says, Sometimes we laugh together. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. And sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven. That's that one o'clock lesson. I hope that you'll stay and you'll eat lunch with us together and you will be a part of us sharing and dreaming together of how it will be when we all get together, God's family. Hopefully, without the loss of a single one. I'm thankful that I'm able to be a part of the Palm Beach Lakes Church. I'm the luckiest preacher on earth to preach for the finest church that I know in the brotherhood. And I owe you a debt, but the debt that we all owe looks upwards. And the thanksgiving we need to give to God is to express gratitude perhaps for each other, for elders and deacons and Bible class teachers and those people that just encourage us when we're downtrodden in their own very special way. But the ultimate thanks. Thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. And what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Are you a child of God? You're not if you don't believe in Him. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am He, you'll die in your sins. 
you're not a child of God if you haven't made up your mind to be one. You do not become a child of God because you've got a good mom and a good daddy. That's not what makes a person a child of God. Because you're a little bit, you, you do more good works than you do evil, that's not what makes you a child of God. It is a turning, it is a repentance, it's a decision that you make. And God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Romans chapter 10, twice in that chapter talks about using our lips to confess that we believe Jesus is the Son of God. And the implication is and then using the rest of your life to confess it also. But it begins with an affirmation that I believe Jesus is the Son of God and then to be buried with Him. The Bible statement, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Have you done that? Then why would you not this day be baptized into Him as your heart cries out and says, God, save me? And then it happens. God adds you to His family. That temple, that church, labor in that vineyard, citizenship in heaven, but with brothers and sisters that love you unconditionally and a brotherhood around this world wherever you go. Brethren, part of His family. But don't give up. The Lord says, you be faithful. You keep trying. If your love is not what it should be, you know that this church will be glad to pray for you this day, that God will help you to be stronger and you can, you can serve Him better. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will, He says, and He cannot lie, I will give you the crown of life. If you're not expecting that crown, you need to make whatever changes that you can make today by coming to the front as together we stand and sing. Will you come?